He's done. He's finished. He'll never win again. He'll never even be competitive again. Nobody comes back from this. Before, no one could touch him. But 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 women come forward, all revealing that they've had affairs with him. His career's over. His sponsor stuck by him, but his game suffered. And then he started to have other aspects of his life spiral out of control. There was the embarrassing arrest, the footage of the dash cam. He was done, written off. Nobody comes back from this. Last Sunday, I sat in front of my television, and I watched as Tiger Woods marched down that course at Augusta. And I am not a golf fan. I put it next to Bob Ross when I want to take a nap. (laughs) Because for some reason, people who aren't even near the golfers talk like this the whole time. Tiger approaching this putt on the 17th. Slight breeze in the background. You can hear the birds chirp. They're probably not even real birds. It's probably just a soundboard that they're using. I'm not a golf fan, but I was just fascinated. I sat, and and my oldest son was next to me on the couch just looking at me like, Dad, can we please watch anything else other than this? And he he didn't get it. He didn't understand what, what, the whole, what, what the whole world was seeing. He didn't understand the magnitude from which Tiger Woods came back from. In what many are calling the greatest comeback in history. It was 1985. And he wore cheap jeans, they said. He, he, he didn't dress the part. His hair was a mess. His facial hair was unkempt. He was just a weird guy. And the people around him would wonder when he left the room, when was the last time the guy actually took a bath? And this is the guy that's running the company? This is the guy that we've put our future in? The guy who keeps promising us that we're going to see this market take off? It's over. So the board of Apple approached Steve Jobs and said, you need to resign. And in 1985, when Steve Jobs left Apple... It was a move that was applauded by the board of directors inside of Apple and the business community at large. It was 12 years later that that same company would go back and buy out Steve Jobs' company that he was running at the time and put him back at the helm. And now many of us carry iPhones, we have iPads, and Macs are so much easier to use. (laughs) It was 2007, and I said, she'll never sell another ticket again. She's gone too far this time. This just, this is the end. We had seen meltdowns before. We had seen some crazy antics, but this time it's over. There is no coming back from this. It was on every news network at a time that people still watched the news. It was all over the internet when Britney Spears decided to shave her head. Just days later, she would attack paparazzi with an umbrella in a photo that is still memed to this day. And people said, she's done, she's finished, she will never come back from this. And I just want to encourage you today. 
that if you think you've got some huge obstacles in your life, if Brittany can come back from 2007, Brittany, and be the success that she is today, it's not too late for you. We love a comeback. We love comeback stories. Now, part of that is our sick fascination of setting people up just to watch them fall. But there is an aspect of of us as a culture that we love comeback stories. There's just something about them that it just motivates us and encourages us. It spurs us on. And we love to see it at the end. We don't always love it in the process. And maybe you find yourself here today in need of your own comeback. Maybe you find yourself here today in need of hope. Maybe you think the end is near. Maybe you are convinced that you've blown it. And you will never be able to get back to the place where you want to be. And with all due respect to Tiger, and all due respect to Steve Jobs, and all due respect to Britney Spears... Today, we are going to look at the greatest comeback in history. Jesus came to this world with a purpose and with a mission. In Jesus is full divinity. That means Jesus is fully God and full humanity. Within Jesus, he is fully man and he is fully God, intertwined. And the reason that Jesus came was for a purpose far greater than that what those who were around him would understand. He came to set us free because all of us have a problem. And that problem is we're not the creator. So we don't get to make the rules. But our creator has made the rules and every single one of us have rebelled against those rules. We have stepped outside of those rules and tried to do things on our own. We have all said that we know best. We have all said we're going to try this my way. We're going to do things the way that I want to do things. And all of us have stepped outside of God's plan in one respect or another. And the problem with that is the Bible tells us there's a cost to be paid for that. Because the standard of God is perfection. It isn't good. The standard of God is perfect. And none of us measure up. But God loves us anyways in spite of the fact that we can't meet the standard that God set. And so he sent his son Jesus to pay the price for that. And the Bible tells us that the cost of our imperfection is death. And that's where we start this morning. Where Jesus has been betrayed by one of his best friends. He's been let down by his best friends. He's been through a few trials that were shams. He's been brutalized. He's been beaten. And we read from one of the biographies of Jesus by a guy named Luke. And you can follow along if you have your Bible apps on your phones or your tablets. and Otherwise, you can follow along on the screens as we jump into Luke 23, 32, where we read these words. Two others, who are criminals, were led away to be put to death with him, with Jesus. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right, and one on his left. Luke sets the scene for us. There is Jesus in the middle. He is crucified. And on his right and on his left are two criminals. This is the contrast. That there is innocence surrounded by guilt. There is the perfection of Jesus surrounded by imperfection. The innocent man surrounded by those who deserved their punishment. And there is Jesus on the cross with nails driven through his wrists and his feet, a crown of thorns on his head, blood undoubtedly pouring out of his body. Each time he needed to breathe, he had to pull up in the agony of that against what his body was going through. There he is, the picture of innocence, surrounded by guilt. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. 
for they know not what they do. And they, the soldiers, cast lots for his garments. We see clearly the heart of Jesus, and that is a heart of forgiveness. The heart of Jesus is a heart of forgiveness. Forget everything you think you know about God. Forget everything you think you know about the church. Forget everything you think you know about those who who proclaim that they follow Jesus. Get back to the heart of God and understand this. The heart of God is a heart of forgiveness. You are never going to be good enough to earn your standing with God. You are never going to be good enough to earn your place with God. You cannot do anything on your own to measure up to God's standard because it's perfection and we are all imperfect people at our core and this is why there is hope available to each of us that here in the midst of Jesus being victimized is his prayer Father forgive them They don't know what they're doing. And at the moment that Jesus is praying for them, they're making a mockery of Jesus. And they're they're casting lots. They're gambling for his clothes, for his garments. They're going into the memorabilia business here. They're like, well, there were a lot of people who followed Jesus, and this could be a hot commodity if if we got his clothes. So as Jesus is praying for God to forgive them, the very people he's praying for God to forgive are seeing him as a mockery, and they are playing games for his clothes. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one, the soldiers also mocked him coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. The word had gotten out. People had seen all the miraculous things that Jesus has done. They had seen the people who had been healed. They've heard the stories. They've seen the lives that have been changed as a result of following Jesus. They've, they've seen it with their own eyes. They've heard all the stories. They've heard how people talked about him and what people said. And here he is, and he's crucified. And they're saying, well, if you could save others, save yourself. The reality is Jesus could have in an instant. The power of God could have easily gotten off of that cross at any instant that he so desired. But it was his choice not to. It was a choice of love. Jesus could have have saved himself. But he chose not to. We can't save ourselves, but we often attempt to. We try to go it our own. We try to make it by our own power. We convince ourselves if we just do this or we just do that, then we'll be enough. We can do it. We can make it. And the reality that we all have to come to terms with is we can't do it on our own. We need Jesus. And that doesn't make us weak. It doesn't make us ineffective. It's just the reality. That this is bigger than us. And we can't. But he can. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. What was declared in mockery was only partially true. Yes, Jesus was the king of the Jews, but Jesus is the king of everything. And here was the king who humbled himself and paid the price for us 
so that we could have a renewed relationship with God. And one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. And so the soldiers are mocking Jesus. Some in the crowd, they see Jesus, and they're mocking Jesus. And one of the criminals that is on a cross next to him, they see all that Jesus is encountering. They see all that Jesus is going through. And the mockery extends to them. And they ask the same question. Aren't you the Christ? Aren't you God as you've claimed? Save yourself. And us. And when you find yourself in a place where you're hopeless, and you find yourself in a place where it's all caught up to you, as undoubtedly this criminal did, whose crimes were being punished, it's easy to allow cynicism to creep into your life. It's easy to become a critic. And here he is as his death is imminent. And he's just piling on because his heart had become so hardened. Mockery extends to the criminal. And yet the other criminal rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And this criminal comes to terms with the fact of who he is. There's a realization He's finally come to terms with the fact of this is who he is. Have you come to terms with that fact? Have you embraced who you really are? Or do you put up a facade and you've put it up so long that even you are starting to believe it? The realization of who he is is not the only thing that the criminal realized, but there was also a realization of who Jesus is. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. A simple prayer. A simple plea. This is what's so incredible about the God that we have. That when we come to terms with the fact of who we are, and we come to terms with the fact that we aren't enough, and we come to terms with the fact that we can't measure up, the heart of God is forgiveness. It's a desire to love you and accept you. And yet God has given us all the ability to make the choice ourselves. And so we have to make the choice. But because of the price that Jesus paid, because Jesus was willing to die, because he paid everything, he made it easy for us to approach him. And it begins with the understanding and then a simple prayer and a simple plea. Opens the door for us to be restored to the God we rebelled against. A simple prayer and a simple plea opens up the door for hope. for grace, and for love. 
And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. This is the hope that God offers. And how is this available? It was now about the sixth hour. And there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. This is when perfection paid for my imperfection. God put my mistakes, my failings, and my sin upon the perfection that is himself in his son Jesus. God took all of the things that I have ever done wrong and all of the things that I will ever do wrong and he transferred that guilt, he transferred that burden over to himself in his son Jesus. He paid the price for my mistakes, but the price was incredibly costly. He died for me. That is the cost of my sin. That is the cost of my failure. That is the cost of my mistakes. That is the love of God. And yet, we don't celebrate today because Jesus was a martyr. We don't celebrate today because God is incredibly unfair. Though when you really boil it down, it's incredibly unfair of what God was willing to embrace upon himself because of me. But that's his love for us. But the story does not end with the death of Jesus. Because if it did, then sin would have won. If it did, then we would have no hope when we die. If it did, we would all be hopeless. So Luke 24 says this. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, when they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but Jesus has risen from the dead. This is the greatest comeback in all of his history this signifies that we have hope that our mistakes and our imperfections and our failure in our sin does not have to conquer us it does not get the final word we have hope because jesus was victorious and god is greater than all of my sin god is greater than all of my mistakes god is greater than every single failure that i will ever have and that i will ever face God is bigger and he has paid the price and he has won and we have an empty tomb because death isn't the final answer and hell doesn't have to be the destination and love wins And the heart of God is a heart of forgiveness that is bigger than my failure and bigger than yours. And this is the hope that's available to all of us. That you're not enough. And I'm not enough. 
that there is a price that we owe that we just simply can't pay. Because the standard's perfection. And we may be really good people. But we aren't perfect. And so we fall short. But when we look at ourselves and we come to terms with who we are in the same way that the criminal came to terms with who he was, And we look at God and we come to terms with who God is in the same way that the criminal came to terms with who God is. And we see what Jesus has done for us and he offers us on our behalf. Hope's available. And it starts... With a simple plea and a simple prayer that changes everything. Because God has already won, God has already been victorious, God has already paid. That we can't pay. And following Jesus begins at a place where we come to terms with the fact that we aren't enough. And we need forgiveness. And God has accomplished that when He died. But an empty grave points to the fact that we have hope. And that death is no longer the final thing that determines everything. And that sin can lose its grip on us. And that hell doesn't win. question you have to ask is are you ready are you ready to embrace the fact that you need Jesus are you ready to embrace who Jesus is and are you ready to start with a simple plea of God save me forgive me I want to follow you understand that you paid the price for my sin and you rose again three days later and I've placed my trust in you a simple plea And a simple prayer. As the criminal uttered. Because of the love and forgiveness. And victory of Jesus. That's the incredible God we serve. That is the greatest comeback in history. And God is offering it to you today. That you could come back from your failures. You can come back from your mistakes. That death doesn't have to define you. And hell doesn't have to be your destiny. God, I pray that we would embrace your love and your forgiveness. The incredible cost the incredible price you paid. And Lord, I pray that we would live in celebration and we would live in victory because of what you have accomplished on our behalf when you paid the price for our sins. And you rose again. 
And so, God, I pray right now for the person in this place who needs the greatest comeback in history. And I pray, God, that they would come to the place where they realize they need you. And in the quietness of this moment, even in their heart right now, God, they would just confess that they need you. That they have sinned and they have fallen short. That your love and your forgiveness is enough. Because you paid the price for them. You died on the cross. And you rose again three days later. And I pray they would come to a place where they ask you to help you, help them follow you. Thank you that we can live with love. Thank you that we can live with forgiveness. And thank you, because of what your son Jesus accomplished on our behalf, that we live with hope. And it's in his name that we pray.